Welcome to part two of the section on convolutional neural networks. So now we're going to look at Lynette and AlexNet. In the previous lecture, we covered convolutions and how they work. Now we're going to look at how they actually put together in practice. So let's get started. So this is a picture that's I think by now quite famous, namely you start with an image, you have a convolutional feature map, you perform pooling, you convolve, you have another feature map, and then you have two fully connected layers, and then in this case, some Gaussian output neurons. The latter actually turned out not to be quite that important, but anyway. So this is something that was invented around 1992 to 1995. So this is actually Lunet 5. Um, what it was used for was handwritten digit recognition on checks. So the problem that AT&T Bell Labs had to solve at the time was they had all those checks that they got from banks and from the US Postal Service, and they wanted to recognize handwritten digits and the dollar amount on checks. They didn't really verify you know, whether that's the correct signature, but at least they wanted to know, well, hey, look, some, some Chevrolet Pallad Whitman Rob got $5,000 for, I guess, probably some car. Anyway, um, so this was a hard problem because they had to actually first detect you know, where on earth those digits are and so on, and Quite honestly, a lot of modern implementations would still struggle because of all the nice ideas that went into the check reading system at the time. But suffice it to say, this was a challenging problem to get all the digits right. So the NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technologies, they actually realized that this was a problem and so they released a data set of 50,000 training data points and 10,000 test data points on essentially digits from, you know, all 10. And these were 28 by 28 images. Why is it called MNIST? Because then Jan Lecam modified it to make it a little bit more suitable and less pathological for image classification by doing suitable crops and so on. Anyway, what they got out of this was this check reading system. And this is a paper that I would strongly recommend everybody to read. It's an amazing paper. It's not well written, but there are a lot of ideas in it. So gradient-based learning applied to document recognition from 1998. And here's what they were able to do at the time. So what you can see is as those digits go through, um, at different levels, um, you had different activations until in the end, it actually got the digit correct. This was a demo video from 1998, so apologies for the low resolution. Now, if you look at that, well, actually that network was a little bit expensive to build if you had many outputs, but short of that, it actually worked really well. This is probably the best they could have built at the time, given the computers that were available at the time. So these were SGI Octane uh, workstations, beautiful blue computers that cost more than cars. Okay. Nowadays, it's trivial to implement this. So for instance, if you want to do this in PyTorch, well, okay, after suitably reshaping the data into, you know, two by two object, you have a 2D convolution, average pooling, another 2D convolution, another average pooling. And mind you, this is using, you know, the original sigmoid activations and average pooling. You'd probably want to replace this with max pooling. Um, and you go and flatten it again. And you apply, you know, a linear neural network, another linear one, and then you get some outputs. And so this is what the state of the art was for a long time. And then along came AlexNet. So AlexNet, if 
you look at that and that's directly cropped from their paper, doesn't look too different from the previous one. Yes, okay, the graphics look a lot more fancy, but short of that, it actually looks very similar, right? So you have convolutions, max pooling, convolutions, max pooling, and the key difference is that it's using max pooling as opposed to average pooling. And the other key distinction is that, well, it uses dropout and reduce. Okay. So if you look at, well, what changed and, you know, why, you know, are we now again in the, you know, era of deep networks? Well, actually, this has a lot to do with the different scaling exponents in the amount of data and memory and compute. So if you look at, you know, 1970s, the iris data set with maybe 100 observations was a good thing. Then 1980s, well, 10 to the 3 observations were good. Um, 1990s, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5. And then we went up by two orders of magnitude. Then we went up by like two or three orders of magnitude and another two or three orders of magnitude. So what happens is that the amount of data has grown by at least a factor of 100 over time, right? Maybe even a factor of 1,000. <clears throat> the amount of memory, well, not quite that much, right? We went up by, you know, a factor of 100 basically every 10 years. Well, so you might say, well, actually it's not quite true because my laptop still only has eight gigabytes or maybe 16 gigabytes of memory, but you know, a decent desktop server would probably do this nicely. What has changed though, is that in terms of number of floating point operations, we've gone from 100 kiloflops, in other words, 100,000 operations for the first Intel process of the 8080, to a megaflop, so that's a factor of 10, the 186, to 10 megaflops. Then we went up by a factor of 100 to the Intel Core architecture. Then we went up by another factor of 100 through NVIDIA GPUs. And then, yeah, basically the past decades seen an explosion. So we've seen a situation where the amount of compute has gone up by four orders of magnitude. Usually when those things happen, the underlying algorithms that exploit this hardware also change. And so we were in the 90s in a situation where deep nets were good because they were very memory efficient and the amount of data wasn't that large. And then as, you know, we got into the 2000s, well, 2010s, you know, kernel methods were the dominant paradigm. And that's because the amount of data hadn't grown that much yet and the amount of compute hadn't grown that much yet, but you could actually store those matrices. And so then at some point towards the end of this, people started struggling really with storing those ginormous kernel matrices, you know, inducing point methods and so on helped. But ultimately you ended up in a situation where you had insane amounts of compute available, still reasonably parsimonious amounts of memory, but at the same time, also large amounts of data. So lots of compute, lots of data, not so much parameterization. This is again where deep learning has its sweet spot. So case in point, if you look at ImageNet, well, you know, this was, you know, over a million observations, a thousand classes, and the images were quite sizable. So if you compare that to, you know, MNIST, which is a lot smaller. So if you look at the AlexNet architecture and compare it to Linux, it's not that different, right? One difference is you have three channels for the inputs and the initial convolutions are larger. They're now 11 by 11. And the next one is, you know, three by three and it's max pooling. Then, you know, for the core of the network, well, you have a lot more convolutions. So in Linux, they have two of them and there you had, you know, a lot of convolutions and pooling operations. And then for the output, well, this is where AlexNet really struggles because you suddenly now have 4,000, you know, hidden 
neurons and a 4000 by 4000 matrix is an awfully large number of computations. As a matter of fact, that's where most of the compute went. Um, <clears throat> the memory went for the operations on AlexNet. Now, these weren't the only things to get done. So for instance, if you look at um, data augmentation, this is what really made a huge difference in practice. So let me give you an example. So at some point we were struggling to match the performance of a published result for some image classification problem. And we tried everything, we did unit tests and everything was the same and we matched uh, all the activations and all the, all the pieces in that chain. And in the end, we found out that what was the difference was that they were using a JPEG decompressor with different decompression settings. And those higher quality decompression settings were what caused all the performance degradation. So that meant that we weren't quite able to match the accuracy. So case in point, it really helps if you have a lot of additional invariance transforms that allow you to retain a lot of accuracy and information but also allow you to, for instance, if you look at this cute cat, and we'll talk more about this later, um, you know, it's clear that if I crop into one of those pieces, well, that's still a cat. Well, the one on the right, that's a purple cat or a brown or a yellow cat, but it's still a cat. And if you ask a child, well, what is it? Uh, even a baby will say, well, it's meow meow. Okay, so, or cat or katsu or whatever, but it's, very straightforward and thus these invariances help. So just to summarize this, if we look a little bit at the complexity, let's look at the various convolutions, right? The number of operations, the flops count, the majority went into the convolutions, you know, for, you know, the you know, layers two, three, and four, and five, right? That's where a lot of the compute went for a total of, you know, one gigaflop compared to, you know, the net, which had like four megaflops. On the other hand, you know, the parameters, that's really in the dense layers. So what you can see is that different layer types have different performance characteristics in terms of whether you need fast memory or whether you need a lot of compute to get good performance, right? Actually, let me move out of the way so you can see it a little bit better. So overall, what you get is that in terms of number of parameters, it's an increase by an order of magnitude, which is significant, but yeah, okay. And you can expect that over, you know, more than a decade, but in terms of flops, it's an increase by almost three orders of magnitude. It's a lot more. And this is exactly why GPUs and acceleration helped. So to sum things up, what we get is that convolutions are now being used instead of feature engineering. And you get all the you know, dimensionality reductions and so on through convolutions and pooling, but also that bigger is better. So more data, more parameters, more flops really helps. The one thing that you saw from this so far is that the last fully connected layers are really expensive. And we're going to discuss subsequently how to fix this because this was something that actually caused a lot of pain and uh, some hardware designers actually started building specialized hardware to address that. Turns out you can fix it with math and it's a lot more effective. There again, are a couple of book chapters that go with it, namely the Lynette and the AlexNet chapter. So go through that and I hope you'll enjoy and find something useful in it.